All right, we're gonna go ahead uh, and uh, kind of pick up where we left off last time. We remember we've been springing off here uh, from John 5. We learned a basic principle in John 5, the last third of John 5. John explains to us why Israel rejected Christ. Uh, it's because they rejected God. They, re they didn't believe in the Father, uh, so they don't receive and believe the Son. If they be believed in the Father, they would believe the Son. If they believed the Scriptures, they would believe in the, in the Lord Jesus Christ because the scriptures testified of him. If they believed in Moses as they claimed to, uh, they would have believed in Christ because Moses spoke about him. Uh, and so that's the principle that we've learned in John. The reason uh, why they don't believe is because they, in Christ, is because, and receive Christ, is because they don't believe uh, and refuse to, re therefore, receive uh, to, uh, don't believe in God the Father. Of course, the corollary that is that is then those that do receive Christ, those who do believe in Christ, are those who already believed in the Father. They already belong to the Father, therefore, and belong to the Father and know the Father, therefore, uh, they, uh, un they see the Father in the Son. Because the Son, remember, comes, he's speaking the words of the Father and only doing the works of the Father. So the ones who belong to the Father, believe in the Father already, receive the Son because uh, they see the Father in the Son. Uh, and that's the great principle we're learning here, uh, is that those who receive Christ in the Gospel accounts here are those who already, for the most part, already belong to the Father. And that's a great principle. And we're going to take this principle now and apply it to early Acts, the ministry of Peter and the Twelve at Pentecost. Uh, and we're going to see what's really going on here in early Acts. Uh, and uh, we'll come back to this slide, but we have to remember we're in this transition period. In early Acts, it begins, everything is about Peter and the Twelve and God's prophetic program with the nation of Israel, which was spoken about since the world began. Uh, and that's going, with Israel's rejection, it's going to fade away and God's going to cast away the nation of Israel, put his prophetic program with her on hold, and put the kingdom in abeyance. So we'll come back to this slide later. Uh, and we kind of sprung off also John G and John 20, 31. Uh, who is John writing to? He's not writing to us in the dispensation of grace, the body of Christ in the dispensation of grace. He's writing to the believing remnant of Israel uh, during this transition period. Uh, and so when you go into Pentecost, remember John, usually we just summarize and pay Peter and the 11 or, and the other 11 or Peter and the 12. Uh, and we kind of forget John, but John's one of the 12. So he's preaching the gospel of John at Pentecost. Uh, and they're preaching, uh, John and Peter are preaching and the rest of the 12 are preaching. Uh, and uh, the ye belongs to this program. Uh, the, the, they're, t they're taking those, uh, they're those who believe in the Father and showing them that the Father has advanced his program with, uh, to bring about Israel's national salvation. Uh, he's advanced his program with them uh, and now he sent his son, they need to receive the son and believe in the son, the Father sent him. Uh, and so that's the ye. It's not the members of the body of Christ, it's Israel, especially believing Israel uh, in this transition period, uh, and especially as they go through that tribulation period. Uh, and the two things that we need to keep in mind here, uh, and we need to, need to uh, determine from the context, are words that all too often we assume things about. And that's the word, words save or salvation. Uh, and the phrase, forgiveness of sins. Uh, when we see the word save and salvation, what I want us to do is stop. Uh, you know that old song, stop and smell the roses? Well, I want us to stop and ask a question. Well, I want us to stop and ask the question, when you see the word save or salvation, you have to ask the question, what salvation? What, are, what is the, are we being saved from? What is whatever in the, the, is in the passage, what are they being saved from? And what are they being saved unto? 
Uh, very important questions, and those can only be determined from context. Save is just a generic word. Uh, it can mean uh, be saved, you can be saved from a variety of circumstances. Uh, I remember mentioning, I think last time I spoke, uh, we talked about the I just turned on the news and I heard just a phrase from this woman, and she said she saved her family. Now, does that mean uh, she converted them all to Christianity? She preached the gospel to them and began, they all believed and entered a right relationship with God and were saved? Of course not. That's, just, that's silly. If you listen to another sentence or two, you realize she was using the word saved. She saved her family from financial ruin by getting a job. Save is, it's a word that has a basic meaning, a general meaning, but you don't really know uh, what it's doing without a context. You can be saved from anything. I remember I carpooled way back in the early days, uh, and, and I was carpooling with someone, and it was kind of really rainy, and the windows were fogged up, and I was going to get on the highway, uh, and he said, whoa, you better stop. This guy's moving into your lane. He's going to hit you, and I slammed the brakes on. Uh, and I said, you saved us. Now, I didn't mean he was saved in eternal salvation or anything like that. He just kept us from uh, entering a crash position. Uh, and even in the Bible, it doesn't always mean uh, salvation unto eternal life, justification before God. Uh, it, uh, Paul is waiting in a prison in Philippians, and he says he's waiting to be saved. Well, obviously, he's not waiting for personal individual salvation. Uh, he's waiting to be set free from jail. Saved, what I'm trying to point out with all these illustrations, oftentimes when we come to the Bible, we think every time we see the word saved, uh, it has to do with individual salvation before God. Uh, and it doesn't. The same thing with forgiveness of sins. Uh, stop and smell. So if we run into the phrase forgiveness of sins, we need to stop and smell the roses, stop and ask the question, what, or I guess maybe the better question would be forgiveness of what sins? And you have to get that from the context. So we can't just assume if it's in the Bible, these words or the, this phrase uh, refer to individual salvation and, and forgiveness of personal sins. Uh, justification before God, saved from sin and death and brought into righteousness and life. Uh, there's a, a million other things you can be saved from. Uh, and when we come now into early Acts, we just want to pay attention to those things. What does the context say they're being saved from? What are the sins they're being forgiven in the context? And uh, we began by looking uh, at uh, Acts 2.5, where we have the key passage here. So let's go to Acts 2.5. This is where we left off last time uh, looking at this verse, Acts 2.5. And he says here in Acts 2.5, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, uh, out of every nation under the earth. And so I just want to stop and talk here a little bit about uh, this devout men uh, and de Luke's use of the term devout. Uh, it's very important because Luke, except for one, uh, one, one uh, reference by Peter in 2 Peter 2.9, Luke is the only writer that uses the, the, uh, the uh, devout terminology. He's the only one. So if we're going to figure out what, the, what he means by devout, we've got to go to Luke uh, because he's the only one that consistently uses it, and he's going to use it throughout the beginning with the uh, book of the Gospel of Luke and on through uh, the Acts, his, his, his uh, record in the Acts period here. Because remember, Acts is written by Luke. Uh, and so with one exception... Uh, you know, Peter, in, in 2 Peter 2.9, Luke is the only Bible write, writer who uses devout terminology. Uh, both Luke and Peter, though, agree on, on something. Uh, and they agree on these, the terms uh, devout uh, and just, they use synonymously. So let's just go uh, look at that as we go through here. Go to 2 Peter. We'll just get that one checked off the list, and you can see... Uh, and then we'll go and start following Luke's references to this. 2 Peter 2.9. 2 Peter 
the Lord knoweth, and I'm not doing the background, we're just reading this verse. Uh, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly. Now here our King James has the word godly. That's the underlying Greek word is the same word uh, in Luke that that's, they translate devout. Uh, so here, this godly is our word devout. Uh, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the devout out of the temptation and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. So there we have this contrast. What I want to, to begin to develop here is just to show you when, uh, when Luke and Peter talk about devout, they're talking about people who are just. Peter's talking about devout people and the opposite of a devout person is an unjust person who will receive judgment. Uh, and uh, so the, 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 the devout person is a just person, the opposite of an unjust person. Uh, and that's important to keep in mind uh, as we go through this. Now let's go to Luke's first use of it, Luke 2. Luke 2 verse 25, here we have the account of Simeon uh, and Anna. Uh, we've looked at this, I think, quite a while ago at the beginning of John, but let's just look at it again now with this devout concept. Uh, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna trace Luke's use of devout all the way uh, to his last use in, in Acts. And here, the first use is here at the birth of Christ. Uh, and he's gonna use it here as a devout, as a just person uh, who is justified before God. Look at verse 25. And, be, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same man was just and devout. See, there we have that same connection that Peter used. Uh, there, Peter was comparing the devout with the unjust, uh, but here, uh, here, Luke is using devout and just uh, as interchangeably, near synonyms. Uh, a devout person is someone uh, who devoted to God and who is just before God. And because he's just before God, he's just before men, or should be just before men. And of course, in the case of Simeon, he is. So you have this combination, a devout person is a just person, one who is justified right before God and therefore just and right before men. In other words, a devout person is one who has been individually saved and, uh, and received forgiveness of their personal sins. They're justified before God. They're uh, devout Jews or devout people. We're gonna see this extends even beyond Jews. Devout, devout Jews equals just Jews, which equals believing Jews. Uh, Simeon and Anna here are believers. Before Christ ever came on the scene, there's a believing remnant in Israel that belonged to God, that were individually saved and their personal sins were forgiven. Uh, and uh, this, Luke uses this devout terminology uh, to bring that out, to bring that out. So now let's trace this through uh, as we go through here. We're gonna see, uh, we'll do, I'll just list them out here in particular. Here are the main references to devout and as we travel through Luke's gospel and Luke's Acts account. Uh, and Luke progresses through the gospel and Acts focusing on various groups of devout uh, people individuals who represent larger devout groups. When we just read about one, and I put, I'm tacking on Anna here because the two kind of go together, so we're gonna include Anna in this. A devout Simeon and Anna represent the devout Jews in the nation of Israel, specifically in, the, in uh, Jerusalem here and in uh, the temple. So devout, he's gonna, Luke is gonna start uh, with uh, focusing on the devout Jews in Israel. Then he's gonna go from there over in Acts 2.5, what we just read in Acts 2.5, and he's gonna talk about devout Jews from all around the world, from the nations of the, all over the nations of the earth. Uh, and that's really gonna be the center, we'll see when we get over there, of Acts 2 and 3, and really all the way to Acts 10, uh, but we'll just focus on Acts 2 or 3. Devout members, then he's gonna go in Acts 8 and he's gonna talk about devout members of the believing remnant uh, who take care of Stephen's body after he's been stoned. 
and we'll take a look at that. Then finally, uh, after Israel's program has been completely shut down, uh, he's going to go and talk about uh, what happens with the God-fearing Gentiles associated with Israel. Now that God has cast away Israel, put on hold his prophetic program, put in abeyance his kingdom, what, what's going to happen now with the God-fearing Gentiles? who were waiting for the fulfillment of Israel's prophetic program, uh, who desired to participate in Israel's spiritual things. What's going to happen with them? And uh, Luke in Acts uh, 10 and 11 there uh, is going to explain that. So we're going to have this progression through the book of Acts. Uh, and so let's look at the beginning here. So we're going to start with devout Simeon and Anna. Uh, and they represent devout Jews within the nation of Israel. Remember, uh, Jesus went to the Jews only, uh, and he limited uh, to his disciples, at least, to the Jews only. I think he only ministered to two uh, Gentiles uh, in the whole gospel account. Uh, only two Gentiles in the whole gospel account. Uh, and uh, so it's limited to, to the nation of Israel. He's limited his ministry to the nation of Israel. And here we have Anna and Simeon representing the devout Jews in Israel, uh, the believing remnant of Israel. And the question is, what were they looking for? What are devout Jews at that time looking for? What are they hoping for? What are they waiting for? That's a critical question. Uh, that, and when we learn that, then we can take that, uh, uh, Luke's going to explain it here, and we take that and we apply it to all other groups of devout Jews and even devout God-fearing Gentiles associated with the Jews through the temple or the synagogues. And so what were our devout Jews looking for? Uh, so let's go ahead and pick up reading here in verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout. So here we have our just and devout. What are just and devout Jews uh, looking for? What are they looking for and waiting for? He's waiting for the consolation of Israel. He's waiting for the salvation of Israel. Israel, remember, they're in the fourth installment of the fifth course of punishment. They've been under the curses of the law for 1,500 years. Uh, their uh, nation is in complete ruin, uh, and uh, they're waiting. The believing remnant, the devout Jews in Israel, the members of the believing remnant, are waiting uh, for the consolation of Israel, for God to send someone to save the nation of Israel. It's in complete ruin. Uh, and that's what the devout Jews are, are waiting for. They're looking for. They're hoping in. He's waiting for the consolation of Israel, someone to come and save Israel. And of course, the point of this passage is God has done it at that time. He sent his son, the Lord incarnated in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and that's who uh, Simeon and Anna are going to be presented to now. Uh, and so the consolation of Israel has arrived. Uh, this whole passage is going to be full of hope uh, and joy. We're at the birth uh, of Christ here, uh, and he's now come, uh, the one who's going to be the consolation, provide the salvation for Israel. Uh, let's keep reading here. Uh, and the Holy Ghost was upon him, it was upon uh, Simeon. Uh, and so we know what's going on here is real. Uh, here you have a devout Jew, the Holy Spirit's on him, and he's talking about what he's waiting and looking for. And he's waiting and we're looking for the consolation, the salvation of Israel. Verse 26, And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. Uh, and he came by the Spirit unto the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God, saying, Lord, thou hast, thou, now lettest thou servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Remember, you just said it, the consolation of Israel, the salvation of Israel, uh, the Lord himself and fleshing himself into the line of David to become an Israelite uh, that could do what no other Israelite could do. 
He's come to fulfill the Davidic covenant that provides for the Israel's national salvation. My man, his eyes have seen his salvation. Uh, he sees the, the baby Jesus, the, in, the child Jesus. Verse 31, and notice he, the, everything's hope and joy. Uh, God's come to fulfill his promises. Uh, it's all hope and joy, uh, and, uh, and what they've been waiting for has come to, uh, has now appeared. Uh, what they've been looking for has now, uh, he's seen. I'll, and uh, who, who, verse 31, which thou hast prepared before the face of all thy people. All thy people is the nation of Israel, the, the Israelites, the people of Israel. Uh, and they, he's come to provide salvation, the consolation of Israel that's going to save and, and restore the nation of Israel. And what is going to turn Israel into? A light, verse 32, to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people, Israel. Uh, remember, you, we could turn to Isaiah 60 and the first couple verses there. He talks about uh, when God saves the nation of Israel, Israel and restore hers and reunifies her. He's going to raise her above all other nations, raise her up. Uh, and the new Israel, his own Israel, is going to be, he's going to shine his glory on Israel. And they're going to reflect it. And that light is going to go out to the, all the Gentiles in the world. He's going to be a light unto the Gentiles, the re-saved nation of Israel. Uh, and Simeon is sitting here. He's, he's seen this whole thing, the consolation of Israel, the salvation of Israel's come and will fulfill God's purpose in creating us, being a light unto the Gentiles, the reflectors of God's glory, God's glory shining on us raising us up above all other nations so that we can dispense his light and blessings and salvation to the nations of the earth, to the Gentiles. And Joseph and his mother marveled at these things. Uh, so everything is all hope and joy. Uh, it's the good news of the kingdom. Uh, fast forward 30 years or so here now, uh, and uh, you're going to be John the Baptist arrives on the scene, and what does he start proclaiming? The king is here. He's paving the way for the king, and he's here, and the kingdom is at hand. God's come, and he's ready to save the nation of Israel. He's ready to carry out his prophetic program. Uh, God's ready to save and restore uh, and reunify the nation of Israel. Let's keep reading. Uh, and uh, oh, let's go down to verse 36 and pick it up with Anna here. Anna, and there was one uh, Anna, one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity, and she was a widow of about four score and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks. Everything's joy, everything's hope, everything's thankfulness. She gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spoke unto him to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So here we have another aspect. What are the devout Jews waiting for? And here Luke begins with the devout Jews in Israel. Uh, and they're looking for the salvation, the consolation of Israel. They're looking for the fulfillment of God's prophetic program whereby he makes Israel the greatest of all nations and the reflector his, of his glory and the conduit of his blessings to all the other, all Gentile nations of the earth. Here looking, and it all begins, Anna says, with redemption in Jerusalem. Remember the order of God's prophetic program for saving the world? First, Jerusalem has to be saved. First, Jerusalem has to be redeemed. Then Judea and Samaria, so that all, na all uh, Israel will be saved. Then God will make up of saved Israel, raise her above all other ones, uh, shine his glory on them, and they'll reflect it out to the rest of the world. And he says here, look for the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, uh, so here we have, these are the things. The reason why I'm taking a little time here is because keep these things in mind. Uh, Luke's not going to repeat them every time. But every time we find devout Jews or devout people, these, we can be a certain that these are the things they're waiting for. 
These are the things they're thinking about. These are the things they're looking for. They're looking for the consolation and, and salvation of the nation of Israel. They're looking for the fulfillment of God's prophetic program. They're looking to participate in the kingdom, the long prophesied promised kingdom of righteousness and peace. And it all begins, they're looking for the redemption in Jerusalem the devout Jews. Now there's one other thing I want to point out, because this is a key passage because it's the first passage. So it lays all the groundwork for all the other passages. That's why we want to take a little time here. So keep all those things in mind. But look at what Anna says here that it's easy to kind of miss when we read through it. Uh, Anna and spoke of him to all that looked for redemption. Uh, here's uh, my point is that uh, when he's giving these devout individuals I think I had it on the pouch here. Uh, when he gives these devout individuals, it's not so much the devout individuals. Uh, they represent the devout groups. And here, you, Anna and Simeon are representing the devout Jews in Israel, and really the devout Jews everywhere. And that's what we're going to go to. There these individual, devout individuals we run into uh, represent bigger devout groups. Anna, in other words, Anna and Simeon represent the believing remnant of Israel. Uh, those who already believe in God, the God of Israel, they already belong to God. Uh, they've already been saved individually by faith, without works. All their own personal sins uh, have been forgiven. And now they're waiting for, to participate in Israel's national salvation uh, and participate and receive Israel's national forgiveness of sins to be separated from all the sins that have been accruing uh, in the nation of Israel for the last 1,500 years under the curses of the law and the courses of punishment. All right, so we have Simeon and Anna. Let's just keep getting in mind because now we're going to go to other groups. Luke isn't going to repeat this every time. Uh, these devout Jews, wherever they are, uh, are going to be, they're, what they're looking for, what they're hoping for, what they're waiting for is the consolation and salvation of Israel. They're waiting for redemption in Jerusalem. It begins in Jerusalem. So now fast forward, uh, this is, we're at the birth of Christ here. Everything's joy and happiness and thankfulness and hope. The Messiah has come, God has sent at the right time, at this time, his son now to carry out uh, the completion of Israel's prophetic program to save the nation of Israel. Now fast forward, uh, what? Uh, 30 plus years or so here to the end of Christ's earthly ministry after his death and resurrection. After his death, arrest, death and resurrection, and that lands us back where uh, in our passage in Acts. So let's go to Acts. Remember, Acts is written by Luke, so we're going to, this is, he's just carrying, continuing on here. Uh, and as I, he says, he's just continuing on. Let's go to Acts 1. Let's stop at Acts 1 on our way over to Acts 2. But let's stop at Acts 1. And look what he says in verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandment unto the apostles. Uh, and so he's uh, continuing this treatise. He's written the Gospel of Luke uh, with his earthly ministry. Now he's writing the, the, uh, the account in Acts uh, that's his it gives the account of what, uh, after his uh, death, uh, resurrection, uh, teaching the, the 12, well, of course, there's only 11 uh, at that point, uh, with Judas gone, uh, but the teaching them about all things regarding the kingdom. Uh, and now he's ascended, and the Peter and, the, the, and Peter and what will be the 12 by the time we get to Pentecost, uh, is in going to Jerusalem, and they're going to stay there in Jerusalem. Now, why are they going to Jerusalem? Because what does Anna say before this? Even she recognizes what most of historic Christianity doesn't. Uh, she recognized that redemption starts in Jerusalem. First, Jerusalem has to be redeemed. Before you can redeem the rest of the nation, you have to redeem its capital city. So they go to Jerusalem to 
uh, to bring redemption to Jerusalem. And that's what we have now in Acts 2. So now we see the A. Uh, let's go over to flip over another page to Acts 2. We read this earlier. Uh, this is really, uh, the, when you get this devout concept uh, and the way Luke is the only one who uses it, the only other one, as I said earlier, that uses it is Peter and Second Peter, one time uh, in a totally different context. Uh, and now uh, he's, Luke uses it throughout the, include, throughout the gospel and the Acts account. Uh, and now we fast forward 30 plus years from the devout Jews at the birth, Christ's birth to now, verse 5, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now we're at Pentecost. Uh, Pentecost especially celebrates the pouring out of the Spirit. Uh, and now you have from all around the world, we looked at the nations a few verses later, it lists out the nations. We're not going to go through them again. But you got people coming from, Jews coming from hundreds uh, and even thousands of miles away. And they're converging in Jerusalem. And some of them, it says, uh, Luke says here, uh, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem were devout men, devout Jews that came from every nation. So now when you see these devout Jews coming from the diaspora, from all the nations of the world, converging on Jerusalem, remembering Anna said uh, that she's looking for the redemption in Jerusalem, the consolation and salvation of Israel, these devout Jews are looking and waiting and hoping for the same thing. They're converging on Jerusalem, uh, hoping and waiting for the, the fulfillment of God's prophetic program with Israel. They're waiting uh, for the nation to be saved and restored and reunited uh, and made into God's own nation, uh, a nation uh, that will be the perfect reflector of his glory to the Gentile nations. Keep all that, as soon as you see devout, that's what they're thinking. He explained it all with Anna and Simeon. That's what devout Jews think. They're all coming. Now, all the Jews coming from around the world weren't devout. Remember, devout means just, justified before God, uh, saved, individually saved, and their personal sins forgiven. Uh, and it's just a minority of all the Jews in town. Uh, but they, he's addressing these devout Jews. They have the same desires and dreams and wishes and hopes uh, as Anna and Simeon. They're hoping for Israel's national salvation. And they wanna, they're hoping for God to send someone to carry out Israel's national salvation. They're hoping for that. Devout Jews from the Gentile nations uh, at the Feast of Pentecost, representing all devout Jews throughout the world. Uh, and they're here for the, uh, to celebrate that giving of the Spirit and for life in the kingdom. Uh, they, too, were looking and hoping for what Simeon and Anna was looking and hoping for. Uh, they were, and what all devout Jews in the land of Israel were hoping for, the salvation and consolation of Israel, the redemption in Jerusalem. Uh, they were coming to Jerusalem to have their joy fulfilled, their hopes fulfilled. Redemption starts in Jerusalem, and now they're in Jerusalem. And their hopes, and they're waiting, and they're looking for the same thing Anna and Simeon were looking for, and all devout Jews were looking for. Uh, the consolation of Israel, redemption in Jerusalem. Uh, but they got some bad news. They got to Jerusalem. Uh, and what did, they, what did Peter tell them? They got to Jerusalem and Peter introduced them, said, yes, God has sent the Savior, the one who can save Israel. But Israel put their Savior and King and Messiah to death on a cross. Welcome to Jerusalem, Jews from out from among the nations. And they, their hopes were dashed. That's what Peter's going to start preaching them. Uh, and he's going to give them some new hope and some new uh, things to look forward to. But they get to Israel there. Uh, he, he explains uh, that, they're, that they had put to death 
uh, they're the one God sent uh, to bring about Israel's salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but Israel put him to death on a cross. Israel killed their king uh, and uh, kind of uh, welcome devout Jews from the diaspora. That's what's going on in the nation. That's what your nation did. The nation you're a member of did that the devout Jews. Uh, and the good news of the kingdom, I uh, remember this early Acts, they have this second offering, I guess you could say, of the kingdom. Uh, the good news of the kingdom was overshadowed with the bad news of the cross. Peter preaches uh, the death and resurrection of Christ as bad news, uh, and that overshadows the good news of the kingdom. Peter's going to explain who Jesus Christ really was. Uh, now remember, it's important to re remember as we get set to go through the rest of chapter 2 and 3 here, uh, that these there, there was no Twitters or tweets or iPads or iPhones. Uh, there wasn't instant messaging. Uh, there wasn't Instagram or any of these other things. Uh, these people, most of them probably didn't know anything about Jesus Christ. They, they were hundreds and thousands of miles away. Maybe some of them there were uh, came to Israel for other feasts and maybe they heard some things about them, uh, but certainly what they were to heard would have been inaccurate uh, and incomplete and, and, and most likely wrong or very inaccurate. Uh, and most assuredly, none of these who came from uh, for distant lands uh, would have had anything to do with his death on the cross 50 or so days before. They were five, 400 to 20, what was it, Jerome was 2,500 miles away. We kind of listed that out in one of our messages. None of them had anything to do with the cross, uh, Christ's death on the cross. Uh, and uh, Pope Peter's going to confront the whole nation, the whole household of Israel. All Israelites are associated with that death on the cross. Even though uh, two-thirds of them here, remember I read somewhere uh, that the Jerusalem's population, at least during the day, could triple during these major feast days, which means two-thirds of Peter's audience uh, would uh, have been from, uh, from, a, from a Gentile nation, would have been part of that diaspora that came to town uh, for the feast. And they wouldn't have known, what they, if they knew anything about Jesus Christ, it was incomplete and probably wrong. Uh, and he's going to tell them who Jesus Christ is. And then he's going to tell them what their nation, the nation they're members of, did. Uh, and that's where he's going to pick it up, the devout Jews. These are Jews who already believed in God. That's who Paul's, or Peter's addressing here. They already believed in God. They already belonged to God. And when Peter preaches using our John 5 principle and our principle in John 14, 1, uh, believe, you believe in God, now believe in me, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, when we apply that principle, uh, Peter's preaching to the devout Jews, the believing remnant from the diaspora. And when they hear what he says about the Lord Jesus Christ, they'll receive and believe in Christ because they already believe in God. They already belong to the Father, so they'll see the Father in the Son, and they'll receive and believe the Son. And we'll see that uh, step by step when we go through uh, Acts 2 and 3 here. But now let's keep for tonight, let's just focus on uh, this following the devout. So Anna and Simeon, Luke's explanation with Anna and Simeon as representative of devout Jews, tell us what they're hoping for, what they're waiting for, what they're looking for. They're looking for the salvation and, or, and consolation of Israel. Uh, to make, be made so that Israel be saved, uh, made into a great nation, the reflectors of God's glory and light to the Gentiles. Uh, and it all begins with redemption in Jerusalem. And now you get to Peter in Jerusalem, uh, and Jerusalem is going to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to reject redemption in Jerusalem. They're going to reject Anna and Simeon's hope and, and uh, desire and wish and what they long to see. They're going to reject that, and that leads us to the next use of the devout terminology, and that's in Acts 8. 
Luke's next use of devout terminology, we have devout Jews uh, from of the believing remnant of Israel uh, who are going to take care uh, of Stephen's dead body with great lamentations. Let's look at Acts 8, uh, verse 2. And devout men, here we have our devout men, men uh, who belong to the believing remnant of Israel. These are men uh, who are part of believing Israel. They're devout, they're justified before God, and now they've come to take care of uh, Stephen's dead body and prepare it for burial uh, and, and the burial itself. Uh, and the thing I just want to bring out here, remember when we read about devout Jews uh, in uh, with Anna and Simeon at the birth of Christ, there was great rejoicing, thankfulness, joy, and hope. When you get to Acts 2, uh, and Peter confronts the nation with what they did, because all those devout Jews in the land, and the na even unbelieving Israel uh, in, in that land, and he confronts them with what they did to their King and Messiah. It dashes their hopes. And now we come to the stoning of Stephen, uh, and the hopes are going to be completely done away with. There are going to be great lamentations. Look at verse 2. And made great lamentations over him. Uh, and he's, uh, you know, they, they imagine I was reading in a dictionary, you know, beating their chest, ripping their, uh, they rent their clothes, and they do all this stuff uh, in great lamentation over the stoning of Stephen. Uh, and this death of Stephen, uh, it's not just for Stephen, it's over Stephen. Uh, it's not just about Stephen. Uh, this is the end of the one-year extension of grace and mercy uh, God gave to the nation of Israel. That's what Peter's ministry here at Pentecost kind of covers, and then that one-year extension of grace and mercy, uh, and it's over. And Jerusalem has, and Israel as a whole, and Jerusalem in specific, has continued to reject their King and Messiah, their Lord and Savior. In rebellion against God, they've rejected Christ in unbelief and to the point where they've now declared it openly uh, and defiantly and unchangeably in the stoning of Stephen. And this members, devout men of the believing remnant of Israel come to take care of his body, prepare it for burial and, and uh, carry out great lamentations over him. It's not just about Stephen. They are lamenting what happened to Stephen, but what they're also lamenting is not just Stephen's death, it's the death, if you put that in quotes, it's the death of God's prophetic program with Israel. God is now going to shut down his prophetic program with Israel. He's going to cast away the nation of Israel temporarily. All this is only temporary, but it's going to cast Israel away. We read about this in Romans 11. Cast Israel away, put their prophetic program on hold, and put the kingdom, the long prophesied early kingdom, in abeyance. Uh, and that's uh, and now you have the believing remnant here uh, with great lamentations at the stoning of Stephen, uh, recognizing that all the hope going all the way back to Anna, and really all the way back throughout Israel's history, but we'll just go back to Anna and Simeon, all the way back to Anna, all that hope, all that looking, all that waiting is now coming to nothing. God's going to set aside his prophetic program with the nation of Israel, and with it, uh, there's no longer going to be a gospel of the kingdom. And that's what's going to lead us next. God's going to uh, cast away the nation of Israel, put his prophetic program on hold. Uh, the earthly kingdom's going to go into base abeyance. Uh, if in uh, the previous, in Acts 2, uh, they, they really announced, Peter was teaching them, they put to death their king, in Acts 2, they put to death their kingdom. Israel's prophetic program was set aside. It was set aside. No more offer of the kingdom, no more gospel of the kingdom. Uh, and, uh, it, and well, we'll pick it up as we go through here, but uh, notice who shows up on the scene at this point. Look at verse 59. 
uh, or excuse me, verse 58. And here's the story of Stephen, cast him out of the seat, out of the city, Stephen stoned him, and witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And God's gonna make him our apostle Paul. So you have great lamentations by the de believing, devout Jews of the believing remnant of Israel. Then there's one final reference to devout people. We'll just call them devout people, and that's in Acts 10. Acts 10. Uh, so now we get to the point, we get to the point here. Uh, Jerusalem has rejected Christ. Israel as a whole has rejected Christ. Uh, the uh, hopes and dreams of Anna and, and Simeon and the believing Jews in, Jerus in uh, Israel and the believing uh, Jews, the devout Jews from the uh, nations who come to town at Pentecost, their hopes have been dashed. They've been totally set aside when you get to the stoning of Stephen and the great lamentations of over this, but there's one group we haven't addressed yet. What about all those God-fearing Gentiles who were worshiping the one true God through Israel? through the temple or through the synagogues. All those God-fearing Gentiles who believed in the one true God uh, in association with the nation of Israel. What about them? Uh, as Gentiles, we know, uh, as Gentiles, they had no hope of their own. They had no hope of their own. Let's go to keep your finger in Acts 10, but go over to Ephesians 2, where Paul explains this pretty concisely. Ephesians 2, verse 11. Ephesians 2, verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by, they, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. They had no hope on their own. But they, the only hope they had was that they could participate in Israel's hope, Israel's salvation. And so you have God-fearing Gentiles all around the world, and, and even here we're going to read about Cornelius. He's in the land of Israel, actually. Uh, and also throughout the whole world, God-fearing Gentiles associating with the nation of Israel through the synagogues who've been brought to the one true God and believe in the one true God uh, through Israel because they recognize they have no hope on their own, but they could participate in Israel's hope. The hope of Anna and Simeon, the consolation and salvation of Israel that would bring, uh, make of Israel a great nation and, and, dis, and through whom God would dispense his glory and light and blessings and salvation to the, uh, to the Gentiles. What about these people? They have no hope on their own. Their only hope was in Israel, sharing in Israel's hope. And now Israel's hope has been cast away. What about the God-fearing Gentiles? What about the God-fearing Gentiles? Uh, and uh, that's what we're going to look at in, in chapter 10 here. They were hoping to participate in Israel's national salvation and forgiveness of sin, participate in Israel's earthly kingdom. Uh, when, uh, where were they now uh, going? Israel, in, when Israel deserted God, when Israel abdicated her divine role to be the conduit of God's blessings to the Gentiles, uh, they deserted these Gentiles. They deserted them. They abdicated their responsibilities to them. Where does that leave the God-fearing Gentiles now? They were looking and hoping for what the devout Jews. Notice they're devout. Let's go, let's read now. Let's pick it up in chapter 10 here. Uh, Acts 10, there, verse 1. We'll start in verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band, that's a Roman centurion, of the band called the Italian band. Uh, and there he was a what? A devout man. 
Now don't skip over this. This isn't devout the way we sometimes, you know, we see some guy sitting on a flagpole for religious purpose, think he's, you know, making himself spiritual or something. We say, oh, he's so devout. We see someone come into a church and cross themselves. Oh, she's very devout. That is not what Luke is talking about. When he's talking about a devout person, as we explained earlier, he's talking about a just person, someone, a believer in God, someone who uh, is just before God. And how do I know that? Because when Cornelius' uh, messengers ex say exactly what uh, Luke says here about a devout man and repeat that to Peter a few verses later, look what they're going to say. Go over at verse, uh, verse 22. Verse 22. Now, the Cornelius, he, Cornelius has sent his messengers, uh, and his messengers are going to repeat what Luke said earlier, but they're going to use a different word. Verse 22, and they said, Cornelius the centurion, that's what Luke said earlier, and verses 1, uh, and verses 1, a just man. We're back at where we began. Uh, a devout man. He's not just talking about someone's put on religious externalities, like we sometimes refer to devout people. Uh, he's devout. He's dedicated to God. He's justified before God. He's a true believer in the one true God of Israel. He has individual salvation and has already received forgiveness of personal sins. He's just. He's already, if we read every word in this account, it's a long chapter, so we're not going to. He's accepted by God. He's clean. He's accepted by God. He's devout. He's just. Uh, and now, uh, and he has the same dreams and the same desires and same longings as Anna and Simeon uh, and the devout Jews from around the world at Pentecost, looking for, is hoping to participate in Israel's national salvation and participate in the consolation of Israel and is waiting for redemption to begin in Jerusalem. And now it's all been cast aside. It's all been thrown away. It's all, not thrown away, but set aside because of Israel, Jerusalem and Israel's unbelief, rebellion against God and rejecting his son. And look what, well, look what this just and devout, a God-fearing Gentile coming to God through Israel. And look what he's doing. Uh, and he says, let's finish verse 2, a devout man uh, and one that feared God. Says he's a true believer. Uh, he's a God-fearing Gentile who believes in the one true God of Israel, and he came to the one true God of Israel through the nation of Israel. Not necessarily in the land of Israel, but uh, through a synagogue in a foreign country and a Gentile country. Now, Cornelius is here uh, in the land of Israel, but there'd be a lot outside the land of Israel as well. Uh, and Cornelius is praying for all the God-fearing uh, Gentiles uh, who believe in the one true God through the nation of Israel that had hoped uh, to participate in the consolation and salvation of Israel, waiting for redemption to be uh, go into effect in Jerusalem. Now that's all been set aside as we, by the time we get to chapter 10 here, uh, and he's praying. And he's praying for, about these things and for these things. And he saw, and, uh, and he gave, uh, and his house, he was feared God and his house, so his whole household, the whole household, he's, he's representing all the God fearing Gentiles uh, out in the world, uh, and uh, gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always, continually, continuously. He saw a vision. Evidently, uh, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him, saying unto him, Come, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? Uh, and he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial to me. Now what, when Cornelius saw what's going on, Israel's rejected their king and Messiah, their Lord and Savior. In fact, they put him to death on the cross and they're adamant in doing that. Uh, even with a second chance through the ministry of Peter and the Twelve, uh, the stoning of Stephen, God set aside uh, all the nation of Israel. Israel has refused to receive their Messiah and king. And Cornelius, all the way, all the way to the end, 
at all times and forevermore is, is praying to God. Uh, and his prayers are going up and he's wondering if God has forgotten him. If God has forgotten the God-fearing Gentiles in the world. Is God forgotten the God-fearing Gentiles who have come to believe in him uh, through the nation of Israel? What about them? What's their, they have no hope on their own. Does God remember them? And God says, the, thy prayers and alms have come up to me memorial. I remember you. Don't worry. I remember the God-fearing Gentiles. I remember them. And he's going to send. And now send, verse 5, and send men to Joppa. Call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodged there, uh, he lodged there whose house is by the sea, and he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Uh, so the Lord is going to remember. He's uh, cast away the nation. He's put on hold their prophetic program, uh, the nation of Israel. He's uh, put in abeyance the, the Israel's kingdom, earthly kingdom. And he hasn't forgotten uh, one last group. It's the God-fearing Gentiles associated uh, with the nation of Israel. He hasn't forgotten them. And he's now going to send Peter uh, to show, uh, to tell them what to do. Uh, they haven't been, they may have been deserted by Israel, but they haven't been deserted by God. He's got, he remembers them. Uh, he remembers them. God didn't forget them. Uh, their prayers and alms were a memorial, a remembrance uh, to them. And it's at this point that God uh, now replaced uh, the gospel of the kingdom with the gospel of circumcision. Uh, this is the first time uh, the believing remnant in Israel has been identified as the circumcision. Uh, Acts 10.45, look at chapter 10, ver uh, chapter 10, verse 45. And they of the circumcision, uh, which believed, were astonished. Uh, Peter's going to go uh, to these, this God-fearing Jew and his whole, uh, excuse me, God-fearing Gentile and his whole household that represents all God-fearing Gentiles throughout the world. Uh, and he's going to uh, bring them into God's blessings. Uh, and he's going to, through the outpouring of the Spirit, uh, by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. They already believed in God. Remember John 14, 1? You believe in God, now believe in me. These Cornelius and his household and all the God-fearing Jews uh, in the world already believed in God. Now Peter comes and he preaches to them. We, we, may, we won't read the whole passage. Uh, he's going to preach to them about Jesus. I guess let's just fit, go back a page. Look at verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of purpose, uh, persons, uh, but in every nation he, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted of him. And the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is the Lord of all. And he's going to go on and he's going to uh, reintroduce Cornelius and his household, and this will hold true for all God-fearing Gentiles throughout the world. Uh, now they already believe in God, the God of Israel. They came to him through Israel. Now they need to believe in the Son, that he sent his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, God sent one. Uh, they, the Holy Spirit is poured out upon them. And the water baptism is done away with, is secondary at best, because uh, the kingdom is no longer an issue. Uh, and they'll receive the Spirit, uh, and they're going to have a foretaste of those new covenant blessings, even as God-fearing Gentiles. While the kingdom is no longer an option, God still provided them with a foretaste of the new covenant blessings by giving them the Holy Spirit. Those who believed in God, they were devout, God-fearing Gentiles, and believed in the one he sent, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, which Peter introduces Cornelius and his household to. Uh, then, uh, in accord with John 14, 1 and John 20, 30, 
uh, and would receive the Holy, Holy Ghost. Uh, and we read about that as we go through here. Uh, and the circumcision now uh, comes on uh, and the God replaced the gospel of the kingdom with uh, the, the, the gospel of the circumcision. Uh, Galatians 2, 7, and we'll just close with this, pick it up here next time. Peter, uh, Paul talks about this in Galatians 2, 7. Galatians 2, 7, remember Peter, James, and John, our John, the Gospel of John, our writer, Gospel of John, verse 7. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Uh, so now the gospel of the kingdom has been replaced with the gospel of the circumcision. Uh, and uh, that is what's going to provide the basis now uh, for their ministry. Uh, and they're going to go out and they're going to operate according to that uh, ministry. Uh, and that's where we'll leave it off this week. This is the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Uh, and here he restores joy, hope, and life to the believing remnant of Israel and to the believing Gentiles out in the world. All right, let's close with a word of prayer.